Welcome to the Va Policella in northern Italy, a wine utopia full of precious treasure. In ancient times, these lands were visited by people of note, from poets to emperors, to take part in legendary wine tastings. The region is most known for Amarone della Va Policella, considered one of the world's greatest wines. But how it came to be is shrouded in mystery. So, Get ready for a rare look inside one of the world's most coveted wine regions, the Vapolicella. I'm Tony Margiata, and you're watching Italy's Best Kept Wine Secrets. Veneto is a region in the northeast of Italy that stretches from the beaches of the Adriatic Sea to the pointed peaks of the Dolomites. It's named after one of the most fascinating cities in the world, Venice. The Veneti people have been inhabiting this part of Italy for over 2,500 years. But people have been thriving here long before that, spanning back to the dawn of humanity. One of the earliest archaeological sites of humans can be found in the Fumane Cave 60,000 years ago in the Valpolicella of Veneto. As people went from hunter-gatherers to farmers at the end of prehistory, the Arisnate people of Etruscan Rhetian origins inhabited the Valpolicella because of its fertile lands. Findings from the 7th to the 5th century BC dating back to the time of the arrival of the Etruscans and their meeting with the Arisnates attest that in this area the fruit of the vine was already transformed into wine. Historical testimonies also report that in the 2nd century BC to the defeat of the Cimbri by the Roman legions was due to the attractive products of the Rhetian grapes contributed in a decisive way. Specifically, in the territories north of Verona, there were wines appreciated by Virgil, ancient Rome's greatest poet, and Strabo, a Greek geographer, and it would appear that the Rhetian wine could be considered an ancestor of the current Valpolicella wines. Some wine amphora dating back to Roman times, still intact, were found in San Giorgio in Salici during the works for the planting of a vineyard. In those ancient times, the cultivation of the vine was developed and in the province of Verona, the Rhetian grape was produced. The great Roman poet Catullus, originally from Verona, was the author 
of immortal poems and drowned the pains of love with a good Rishin wine. Catullus's father offered this wine to Julius Caesar as his guest at Lake Garda. Even Pliny the Elder, the Roman naturalist, appreciated it. He wrote sometime between 29 and 70 AD about eating at the table the dried Rishin grapes from a field in Verona. Another Latin writer, Suetonius, said that the wine of Verona was greatly appreciated by the Emperor Augustus. And Strabo said that it was among the most praised in Italy. All of these accounts paints a picture that the area around the Verona province, Lake Garda and the Vapolicella had fertile soils, good climate and delicious wines made with dried grapes. And while the references to Rishin wine seem to infer a sweet red wine made from dried grapes, and the Romans did love their sweet wines, it's logical to assume Recciotto della Vapolicella, a sweet red wine made from dried grapes, is a direct descendant and considered the ancestor of all the Vapolicella wines. Recciotto derives from the Venetian word reccia, referring to the ear. The top part of a Corvina cluster, known as the ear, had the sweetest grapes and only those were used for making high quality Recciotto. So was Riccian wine always a sweet wine? Some evidence tells a different story. And the great wine Amarone della Vapolicella may provide some compelling insights. Today, the Vapolicella has a thriving wine industry and one of Italy's most important wine regions. The Vapolicella is not a city. It's a place located just north of the city of Verona and just east of Lake Garda. It's actually a large valley with many little valleys inside of it. The name Vapolicella derives from the Latin words Valis Polis Celle valley of many cellars. The Romans conquered the area over 2,000 years ago and it appears they named this place after something important. The name indicates the Vapolicella was a thriving wine production area since before they arrived, reaffirming the evidence of a thriving wine culture before their arrival. There are few places in the world whose name can be derived directly from wine. What did the ancient people know about this special place? A group of scientists recently excavated an area in the Vapolicella where they discovered prehistoric grapevines and grape pollen several layers below the ground. After an analysis, the research concluded these vines and pollen were 6,300 years old. They also discovered there was a period of about 3,000 years that the people inhabiting this area were farming and thriving from these lands. This was all done before the Roman period. It's likely there was already a thriving wine culture in the Vapolicella and that the Romans perfected the farming and vinification techniques. Today, there are two main areas of production for Vapolicella wines. There is the Classico subregion and the Vapolicella subregion. The Classico area is the original historical area of production, while the Vapolicella is the extended area that came later. Why the two areas? The Classico zone is made up of more rugged terrain, high elevations, steep slopes with rock, marl, and skeleton soils. The area is much harder to farm and demands strong and highly skilled labor to cultivate the land. The Vapolicella extended area rests on flatter land, making it feasible for heavy machinery to industrialize the land and machine harvest the grapes. Not always, but oftentimes, you'll find the big industrial wineries 
in the extended Vapolicella for this reason. The extended area really came about due to the success of wines coming from the classical zone, which is very restricted and cannot expand. More demand for Valpolicella wines necessitated this extended area. That's why you'll see some Valpolicella wines containing the word Classico on the labels while others don't. These are small details, but they give you a clue as to where the wine comes from. There are five communes in the Valpolicella Classica. Marano, Negrar, San Pietro in Cariano, Sant'Ambrogio, and Fumane. The classical designation can't be found on the wine label unless the wines come from these five communes. I went on a trip to the Fumane Valley to get a closer look at the Vapolicella family of wines, like the Classico, Classico Superiore, Ripasso, and Amarone della Vapolicella, considered today as one of the world's finest wines. The name Fumane likely derives from the Italian word fumo for smoke, referring to the clouds that envelope the hills after a storm. It's the Fumane Valley where I discovered a hidden gem winery producing a treasure trove of magical wines, the Ugolini family estate. But as you'll soon see, the Ugolini wines are so much more than just delicious drinks. And once you've discovered those secrets, you may never taste wines the same way again. As the popularity and demand for Valpolicella wines grew throughout the world, the big wine houses had to industrialize their production methods to keep up with the demand. As production levels grew, the quality of wines began to fall. At the peak of this industrialization of mass-produced wines, Angelo Ugolini, the original owner of the estate, passes away, leaving his wife and children to take over the family business. It was his son, Giambattista, that took the reins to lead the estate into the future. This crossroads of mass-produced wine and the passing of his father and Giambattista's passion for nature, the arts, and traditions he made a decision in 1996 to convert the estate to organic farming. Now today, organic wine is commonplace, but in the mid 90s, it was a revolutionary decision in the Vapolicella. The neighboring wineries thought he was crazy to go back to using more natural and traditional farming methods, but it turned out to be the right decision for the long term. Giambattista Ugolini just might be one of the first terroirists in the region, not only because of organic, sustainable farming, but also because he devised a crew system for the Vapolicella wines at the estate. So every wine expresses a snapshot of a specific vineyard breathing life and character into the wine. And we'll be taking a deeper dive later into those wines including an Amarone single vineyard crew. In questo video cercherò di raccontarvi in 5 minuti 30 anni di lavoro. Non sarà semplice, però volevo veramente trasmettere quella che è la nostra filosofia in vigna, il nostro modo di essere e di operare. Questa è la mia valle, è la valle di Fumane. Come dico sempre io, è la nostra anima, è il nostro sogno questa valle. Dove però siamo fortunati perché è facile fare viticoltura, perché qui abbiamo le, le perfette condizioni climatiche per la vigna. Ecco perché qui, a 300 metri, da dove sto parlando ora, 
c'è una villa romana dove negli anni 60 degli archeologi hanno scoperto questa Pagos romana, la, la cantina più antica che si è visto del primo secolo. Ci sono delle, delle canalette di terracotta per portare l'acqua calda sotto alle vasche per iniziare la fermentazione. Cioè, qui in questa valle facevano già il vino nel primo secolo, appunto per questa bellezza di questo clima, microclima mediterraneo. Questa valle prosegue, entra direttamente nelle Alpi, che ci regala questa magnifica ventilazione e questo sbalzo termico notturno, perché qui alla notte, alla sera, anche in pieno agosto, c'è freddo. Dai 30-35 gradi giorno ai 15-20 gradi notte. Dico, per, immaginate per i profumi della vite e per le malattie è perfetta. A, a un chilometro da qui, a nord, non viene più l'olivo. L'olivo non riesce più a vivere e a vegetare. Voi sapete che l'olivo è l'emblema del clima mediterraneo. Questo grazie a cosa? Grazie al più grande lago italiano che abbiamo, che è il lago di Garda, che grazie a questo vento, che noi in dialetto veronese è il vento del Pelar, che è un vento costante, ci porta questa, questa brezza calda, in contrasto ai venti freddo del nord, dove qui la vite e l'olivo vegeta in maniera spettacolare. Questa valle è una valle fluviale, dunque i terreni del fondo valle sono tutti terreni dove siamo qui ora di detriti, di sassi strappati alle rocce nei secoli, mentre le dorsali sono entrambe di origine vulcanica, grazie a due vulcani, la Fumana, che ha condizionato le nostre cinque vigne, e a Santa Maria Valverde, che ha fatto la dorsale est di questa valle. Noi abbiamo cinque vigne, dove facciamo cinque vini, un po' il sistema cru, Ogni vigna ha il suo vino e dove la corvina, che è il nostro vigneto principe, cresce su cinque terreni differenti. Passiamo dall'argilla alla manna, che è il cacare bianco, che è il minerale migliore per la viticoltura. Passiamo al tufo, passiamo alla pietra lastolare, dove la nostra corvina riesce ad andare giù in cerca di acqua, a rompere le fessure della pietra. Ecco perché noi siamo spettatori in vigna. Infatti il nostro lavoro è guardare e cercare di non rovinare ciò che la natura ci regala. Noi combattiamo ogni giorno per portare tutto in equilibrio. In 2022, Gian Battista was awarded knighthood by the Italian Republic for his contribution to the restoration and preservation of the historic Valpolicella. With the acquisition of Villa San Michele, a 19th century Austrian prison, now converted to a tasting space for the Ugolini wines, the family estate rises above the Valpolicella hills as a historical treasure. Today, Villa San Michele is one of the most fascinating places in the Valpolicella. Gian Battista entrusted the restoration of the villa to small craftsmen from all over Italy. Glassmakers, metal engravers, wood carers, stone sculptors with the artistic talent that distinguishes Italy from the rest of the world. One of the restorative projects at Villa San Michele are the characteristic stone walls called Marogne. Found all over and around the Vapolicella, the Marogne are the original solar panels with multiple functions. They support the priceless landscapes so the hilly vineyards don't wash away from the rain. The stones absorb heat from the sunlight, keeping the soils warm even in the winter months 
and give home to insects that keep the soils in balance and fertile for the vineyards. John Battista found the most skilled stone carvers in the Valpolicella to restore these walling systems that contribute not just the art and beauty of nature of the region, but also give rise to monumental wines. John Battista is not simply the owner of a family winery, but a person with a philanthropic vision that combines the nature, history, and craftsmanship of the Valpolicella into a wine experience with meaning. His commitment to safeguarding art, nature, and the great works of humankind somehow finds itself in every glass of Ugolini wines. I arrived at the Ugolini estate in early September, just as the harvest was beginning. Patches of rain clouds were hovering in the area, and so the harvest team were on call to pick the grapes at any moment. The first single vineyard we visited was Pozzetto. It's located in front of Villa San Miguele. Pozzetto produces the Vapolicella Classico wine, a traditional red blend of the region. As I walked down the rows of Pozzetto, I felt immediately transported into ancient Italy, a time when the world was too large to comprehend and no technology to distract the mind. The beautiful architecture of the vines expressed the natural achievements of humankind and uniquely representative of ancient Italian scenery. Pozzetto is the Ugolini family's first generation vineyard. It's the legacy left behind by grandfather Angelo, the founder of the family estate. Here, the winds of the valley have dragged stones torn from the mountain rocks to formulate the soils and support the Pergola Veronese vine training system, which produces 90 quintals per hectare. The vines grow above the head in orderly fashion. It's a brilliant ancient system of cultivation that can be traced back thousands of years. The canopies protect the grape cluster from too much sun exposure. Protecting the grape skins maintains the aromatic compounds found in the grapes. Pergola Veronese also produces a corridor below the grapes, allowing winds to blow underneath and keeping them cooler, especially during hot summers. The canopy system with that wind corridor allow the grapes to develop with higher acids, ample polyphenolic material, and proper sugar levels, so the resulting wines are par excellence. The key to the system is managing the vines to ensure the yields are low. The Ugolini crew system takes this a step further by doing a first pass harvest targeting only the healthiest grape clusters and cutting off any subpar grapes and only making wine with the finest. Only native varieties of the Vapolicella like Corvina, Corvinone, Rondinella, Molinara and others are grown in the Pozzetto vineyard. The wine is fresh, fragrant, and crisp, so you can enjoy it as an aperitivo or with light fare. Unlike many industrial wineries, the Pozzetto Vapolicella Classico single vineyard crew ages in steel vats without any alteration or addition of flavor or texture from oak. The wine ages in the cellar for three years before making it available to the public. I met with Angelo Ugolini, the son of Giambattista, and named after his grandfather, whose primary role is the procurement of the vineyards. Leading a small harvest crew, I got to see exactly how they harvest the grapes using the crew system. Allora, Tony, noi stiamo vendemmiando la corvina che andrà a fare il nostro Valpolicella. Siamo nel vigneto delle Giarole, o Pozzetto, una copertura di circa 4 ettari e mezzo. 
e l'importante eh, di questa operazione qua in Valpolicella è che le uve siano perfette per andare in cassetta quindi l'uva deve essere raccolta perfetta senza tagli senza problemi senza difetti meccanici dell'uva ogni grappo deve essere perfetto ogni grappo eh. deve essere controllato eh. da mani esperte come i nostri ragazzi e anche il lavoro a, fino alla vendemmia deve essere fatto in un certo modo metti solo uno strato a, a una strato. giusto? solo uno strato che più strati di uva vanno a compattare l'uva esce l'acqua si bagna e si sviluppano le muffe quindi il minimo difetto può portare allo sviluppo di umidità e quindi di muffa poi le uve vengono stoccate in un ambiente in cui la temperatura viene controllata l'umidità viene controllata e la temperatura dell'aria tutto quanto quindi l'ambiente è il più perfetto possibile però il prodotto deve entrare perfetto se no non si possono fare i miracoli con la tecnologia e cosa, cosa serve questo? per sapere se è stato messo il giusto quantitativo di uva nella cassetta tramite il peso sappiamo che la cassetta pesa 60 grammi 70 anzi deve essere circa 6 kg e mezzo come in questo caso qua ok massimo 6 massimo 6 esatto Pozzetto has a lightweight body but full mouthfeel seductive aromatics of veronese cherry strawberry with rose petal notes a touch of pepper and a mineral finish. This is the wine that Ernest Hemingway, one of the greatest writers of all time, romanticized about in his books. The next day we went to the San Michele vineyard, located on the hill behind the villa. This single vineyard crew is the Vapolicella Superiore wine, and named after the church behind the vineyard. As I approached the vineyard on foot, I began to realize how steep the slope was. Climbing the rocky stairs, I lost my balance because I wasn't prepared how quickly the slope cut upward. This splendid vineyard lies on the crest of the valley at about 650 feet above sea level. Exposed to the southeast, it's supported by a deep tufa slab of rock, which gives the wines great elegance and aromatic complexity. Here, the Veronese a spalier vine system is used to maximize the sun exposures at such a steep slope. The vines are tamed by human hands, producing a low 70 quintals per hectare, offering high quality grapes for wines with a strong identity. Another characteristic of the vineyard are the marogne stone walls that protect the landscape from washing away while attracting sunlight to keep the soils warm and shelter for the proper insects to keep ecological balance. Like Pozzetto, the grapes are hand harvested and hand selected, keeping only the best clusters for vinification. The blend is primarily Corvina, secondarily Corvinone, and then Rondinella, along with a tiny percentage of Oseletta. The grapes are pressed the same day of harvest and are aged in French barrique and large oak casks for at least two years, depending on the vintage. The wine rests in bottle in the estate cellar for a period of an additional three years, so a total of at least five years of aging before releasing to the public. The wine has a brilliant ruby red color with an aroma of red fruits, such as Verona cherries, a mix of delicately sweet and spicy notes reminiscent of cocoa, nutmeg and vanilla. It's a super smooth and sophisticated wine that will tantalize your senses for hours of pleasure.
next destination was found on the back roads of the Valpolicella. When you leave Villa San Michele and ascend to the peaks of the Fumane Valley, a trove of treasures are waiting. First, we had to pass through the center of the commune of Fumane and then work our way up in elevation. We were on our way to a mountain peak called Monte Solane, or the Sunny Mountain. When we arrived, I noticed we were alone with the vineyards. There wasn't a person, or a house, or a store anywhere in sight. The higher we went, the more rugged the terrain got. We arrived at Monte Solane. This is the single vineyard crew that gives birth to the Ugolini Ripasso della Vapolicella. On the northern border of the Vapolicella rises Monte Solane. It's a scenic ridge dazzled by Lake Garda that breathes the breath of the Dolomites. At an altitude of 2,130 feet, majestically watched over by falcons, the vines grow on a deep slab of prune stone and their roots are forced to dig deep among veins of fossil clay to gather life. Thus, they come to offer a low yield of 60 quintals per hectare for the finest quality. Prune stone is also known locally as Lessinia stone, referring to the nearby Lessini mountains. The stone was created in the Jurassic period 145 million years ago. These rock formations were formed by vast numbers of shellfish dying and sinking to the sea floor. Once they hit the sea floor, they fossilized and turned into rock or prune stone. So the foundation of one of the world's most important wine regions was formed on the bed of prehistoric rock and the history of the earth is buried under this vineyard. It's as if the vineyard forms the ceiling of the earth's museum. The prune stone was used for making tools and building structures in prehistoric times. And the Romans used it to build many structures and pavements in Verona. While it's technically not marble, that's exactly what it looks like. Today, it's a secret ingredient in the fine wines of this region, and it can't be duplicated anywhere in the world. Monte Solane is embedded with prune stone. At one time, millions of years ago, there was a tectonic shift underground that forced the creation of mountains. Today, it's a unique terrain that produces a unique wine, a sea above the sea. The vine roots work hard to crawl deeper into the earth and breaking these prune stones, extracting a treasure of minerality for the wine. Due to its location to Lake Garda, Monte Solana enjoys fresh air in the morning that sparks vegetative growth and life in the vineyard. While the cold winds of the Alps protect the vineyard from parasites at nighttime, keeping it healthy and ecologically in balance. Only the finest Corvina grapes are hand harvested and selected for this Ripasso crew. The grapes are pressed the same day of harvest to capture their freshness and fermented in steel vats for about six months while they wait for the Amarone Pamas. After the Amarone is made, the Ripasso in the steel vats go through a secondary fermentation on the Amarone Pamas. This increases the intensity and richness of the aromatics and flavors and adds more structure. This second pass over the Amarone Pamas is called the Repass or Ripasso. The wine then ages in French Barrique for about 20 months, followed by at least three more years in the bottle in the estate cellar until releasing to the public. The total process is at least five years. This is not only a high elevation single vineyard crew of Ripasso della Vapolicella, but it's also a monovarietal wine of Corvina that passes through an Amarone Pamas. The wine has a dark and brilliant ruby red color with an intense aroma reminiscent of ripe red fruits, white pepper, 
tobacco leaf and cocoa with a pleasant note of balsamic reduction and just a hint of Mediterranean herbs. A warm and well-balanced palette with a clean and dry finish. Just 19,000 bottles handcrafted annually depending on the vintage and aging potential of 15 to 20 years. Amarone della Vapolicella is considered one of the world's greatest wines. Part of its secret recipe is a process called appassimento. Appassimento is the process of air drying the grapes before fermentation. Its full velvety body with a long list of complex flavor notes and aromatics and its ability to age for decades has become a coveted wine among collectors. It's common speak in the wine world that Amarone is a relatively newer wine that now has a place in the arena of grand wines like Bordeaux, Burgundy, Barolo, and Barbaresco. Some say because the wine was anointed with the DOCG classification, the highest of the Italian wine disciplines in 2010. Others say Amarone was created by accident in 1936. Considering the long and rich wine history of the Valpolicella, it seemed like a contradiction that Amarone was a relatively new wine compared to the other titans of wine. And in fact, there are other contradictions surrounding this wine. For example, what does Amarone mean? Amarone comes from the Italian root word amaro, or bitter. When you add the three-letter suffix O-N-E, at the end of a word in the Italian language, it makes the object bigger. For example, libro, or book in Italian, is converted to librone, with the suffix meaning big book. Or porta, for door in Italian, is converted to portone, or big door, with the suffix. So logically, one would think that amarone means the big, bitter wine. But if you've ever tasted an amarone before, the last word anyone would use to describe this wine would be bitter. It's anything but bitter. The first mention of Amarone actually dates back again to the poet Catullus, around 55 BC, born in Verona and who wrote about a wine in Latin as Calices Amariores, or bitter wine glasses. Fast forward to 493 AD in a letter from Cassiodorus, the minister of the king of the Visconths, requested wine made from dried grapes from the Valpolicella for a wedding. In the 1700s, Francesco Scipone Maffei, a writer from Verona, writes about an amaro of a particular grace in the Valpolicella. The story goes that it was in 1936 when a cellar manager named Adelino Lucchese finds a long forgotten barrel of ricciotto that continued to ferment until it became Amarone. In fact, when he found this wine, he apparently said, this is not Amaro, it's an Amarone. He didn't mean that the wine was literally bitter, according to our meaning of the word. He meant that it was a bitter ricciotto because it was dry and not sweet like a ricciotto should be. So Signor Lucchese gets credit for coining the term Amarone in the early 20th century. What's a little misleading is when the wine intelligentsia claimed 1936 was the birth year of Amarone due to an accident. This is another contradiction. It's hard to believe that 1936 was the first time a winemaking accident happened in the Valpolicella. Sweet wines were much more appreciated in ancient Rome until really the 20th century when dry wines became more desirable. And I think what they call an accidental discovery is really a moment of stylistic change in the wine world which we are moving away from sweet wines and moving towards dry wines. Dry wines would have been considered bitter 
in ancient times. And so Amarone means the big dry wine. It might seem impossible, but the Jeep took me off the beaten path in one of the world's most famous wine regions. It was a long and curvy dirt road with no name. A road you can't find on Google. A road without a sign. A road that led to one place. We were on our way to the vineyard the Ugolini family uses to make their Amarone single vineyard crew. As the Jeep took us up higher along the dirt road with no name, I realized I'd never have gotten this far on foot. Why on earth would anyone plant a vineyard so hard to reach? Great wines come from great works in the vineyard, but the location of a great vineyard is just as important as the human hands that shape it. I felt like I was on a stairway to heaven. While the bottom of the vineyard impressed the eyes, the top view impressed the heart. They call the vineyard Valle Alta, or High Valley. It hangs on the southeastern facing slope of the valley at 840 feet above sea level. The high elevation allows the grapes to undergo wide thermal excursions. This is the difference between the high and low temperatures of the day. And when the low and high of the day are drastically different, say 80 degrees Fahrenheit, in the day and 55 degrees at night, this phenomenon promotes the production of aromatic qualities and polyphenols that produce complex flavors in the grapes. The soil is comprised of fossil marl that is millions of years old. The steep slopes allow excess water to drain away from the vineyard, forcing the vine's roots to climb deeper and deeper into the soils in search of water. It's this struggle for sustenance that gives birth to complex wine grapes needed for an age-worthy wine. And since the vines rest on such steep slopes, the espalier system of vine training is used to expose the grapes to proper sunlight. In various sections of the vineyard, you'll find native grape varieties like Corvina, Corvinone, Rondinella, or Seleta. The Amarone discipline requires 45 to 95 percent Corvina and or Corvinone and 5 to 30 percent Rondinella. The minor aromatic varieties like Oseleta cannot exceed 10 percent. In the Valpolicella there are many minor but native varieties that producers can choose from like Oseleta, Molinara, Croatina, Ancelotta and others. For Valle Alta Amarone, the Ugolini family makes use of four native varieties. Corvina Gentile or Corvina Veronese, which is the main grape of the blend and gives a generous amount of ripe red fruits with floral notes and a transparent red color. Corvina Grossa or Corvinone provides a spicy character and an excellent contrast with the fruit-forward Corvina Gentile. Rondinella gives another dimension of ripe fruit and herbal notes, more acidity, and a texture that's different from Corvina. And Oseleta, which adds pigment, richness, and structure. Like all of Ugolini's vineyards, the grapes are hand-harvested and hand-selected at the perfect moment of maturity at a very low 60 quintals per hectare, which is half of the legal amount allowed to ensure the highest grape quality possible. They are then placed in crates 
and transported back to the cellar. The grapes rest in these crates while undergoing a pasimento, which is the partial air drying of grapes. This process will go on about six months until the grapes have lost 50% of their original weight. A pasimento is an ancient tradition and known to intensify the flavors, textures, and aromatics in the wine. At this point, skilled workers and family members go through another hand selection process taking only the finest of the dried clusters and only those are used for making the Samarone. The grapes are then softly pressed and undergo fermentation. Since the sugar levels are high from the apacimento, the Amarone will arrive at a higher alcohol volume of around 16% on average. While the Amarone discipline allows for up to 9 grams of residual sugar in the wine, the Ugolini Valle Alta Amarone is typically less than 1 gram, which makes it a more traditional and classic dry style of Amarone not easily found among today's international fruit bomb styles. The wine ages in a combination of French barrique and large oak casks for 36 months and at least two years in the bottle before releasing to the public. The Ugolini family will age their Amarone and other wines as long as it takes in the estate cellar until the wines reach optimum drinking performance. They released their 2012 and 2011 vintages after the 2013 vintage, for example, at 9 and 10 years of cellar aging, respectively. Besides the single vineyard crew system with traditional organic farming, I found the Ugolini philosophy of winemaking to differentiate in terms of aging. They will age their Amarone 7 to 10 years in the estate cellar if need be, so that you don't have to age their wines in your cellar. The Valle Alta Amarone is capable of aging 20 to 30 years depending on the vintage. The aromatics of this wine are seductive and are just as pleasing as the full-bodied and velvety textures that follow. Hints of red fruit jams and Verona cherries and mixed dried fruits stand out with hints of sweet spices like tobacco, coffee, cocoa, licorice, and nutmeg. The palate is graceful, elegant, and soft with a never-ending finish, but at the same time, dry. The super ripe fruits on the front palate with the dry finish is what gives this wine its eternal name, Amarone. The Valpolicella is rich in history, ingenuity, art, and wine culture. Just like the Marone that protect its priceless landscapes, the Ugolini family has a mission to protect the traditions of the region in a profound way. Not just by making great wine, but by weaving wine with the creative works of humankind. Placing wine at the centerpiece of history so we can see what ancient people saw, taste what they tasted, and feel what they felt. In this way, we can share the timeless ritual we call the celebration of life.
While this police chale, the valley of many cellars, has attracted those who seek treasure through wine throughout the ages. While its reputation will stir debate into the future, the Val Policella name is cemented into the stones of wine history forever. If wine is life, then the Val Policella is the cosmos. So sip and you shall find. I'm Tony Margiata, and I'll see you next time on the next episode of Italy's Best Kept Wine Secrets. Oh.